Created for changes, chosen for greatness. All things are possible, be all you can be in Christ. Maximize your life. Hello, wonderful, beautiful day. We've been having good sunshine and um, we are allowing the sunshine of the Son of God to shine into our hearts today. Welcome to Max Life, this Sunday morning, your Christian talk show. Um, with me in the studio this morning is Reverend Dr. Peter Adigbie, good the morning. chief host, and Jerry bent minister for youths and our producer good morning and from me i welcome you once again to this beautiful broadcast this beautiful day that the lord has made um we've been looking at the story of esther for some weeks now certain lessons have been drawn out drawn out and um today um dr peter will be taking us through of what it's been all about why the book of esther what's the relevance and all that and i'll hand over to peter now to do that for us thank you thank you to you um the book of esther is quite a very remarkable book very unusual and i just love all our listeners to uh, take time to read through the book yourself many times it is a very remarkable book it's one of the only two books named after women in the Bible. It is also one of the only two books that never mention God's name directly. But you can see the hand of God and the influence and intervention of God all through the book. It's also a kind of a romantic story written during the Jewish exile. And it holds very significant lessons for us today on how to live and behave in a non-Christian society. Mm. This we are believe this we are believers in God, um, living in the reign of a pagan king, mm. and they were able to handle themselves wisely. Yes. They were able to, you know, just like Daniel, comparative um, person to Esther, was Daniel in the Bible. And he survived successive kings. He never lost his faith. But then he had such wisdom that he was respected in the highest echelons of power. And so this is an exceptionally well-written story of a king called Xerxes or Ahasuerus, whose kingdom stretched at that time from India in the east mm -hmm. to Egypt in the west. Wow, time, that was yes, quite a it was, distance. It was, it was, it was <laughs> a big, big, the Persian kingdom was a big one. And this was a time when he was contemplating war with the Greeks. So he had a conference with his allies that lasted about six months. <coughs> and it was at the end of that conference, they had a seven day feast uh, where he sent for his wife Vashti to come and dance before the men, and she refused. And this caused him quite some embarrassment, especially because the other men didn't want Vashti's behavior to set a precedent in their own homes. So, it was suggested to the king that a beauty contest be held to find another wife for him. And this was serious business because it, 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 the beauty contest was serious. I mean, each, each girl had to spend 12 months um, in a beauty parlor, beauty, as it treatment. Were, be beauty treatment. Getting before, their own botox of that day. <laughs> yes, before one night with the king. So Esther, a Jewess from the tribe of Benjamin, won that contest, but at the advice of her older cousin and guardian, Mordecai, she kept her Jewish identity secret. Mm. 
because of anti-Semitic attitudes at that time. And so the second scene to the whole story opens with a man called Haman, who was elevated to the position of a prime minister in the kingdom. He was a descendant of Agag, a tribe with a long history of animosity with the Jews. And the flashpoint actually came when Mordecai refused to kneel down and worship Haman, which led Haman to ask the king for the annihilation of the entire Jewish race. So Mordecai had to uh, reach out to Esther to try and intervene. Meanwhile, Haman had become so incensed that he built a gallows 23 meters high to hang Mordecai. That's apart from exterminating the people, the of, people his race, of his race, just yes. as punishment. Yes, that was wow. just just being really mean. But the tide turned when Esther literally took her life in her hands and walked into the courts of the king uninvited, and he found favor with her and agreed to attend her party. And so the night before the banquet, the king had insomnia and got up to read. And he came across some old diaries and read an account of how Mordecai had saved his life but had never been rewarded. So first thing next, next morning, he woke up and called for him and to ask him what he should do to honor someone who has uh, pleased him. And Haman thought it must be him. <laughs> <laughs> so Haman suggested a fright. parade of honor and the person should be made a prime minister and all that. And the king agreed with him and sent Haman to perform the honors. What a divine turnaround. And so this is what we find in this in this story. This, this divine turnaround, these mysterious interventions. And uh, so eventually... Um, the king and Haman came in to the banquet that Esther had uh, organized. And on the third day, Esther plucked up courage to ask mercy for her people. And when the king heard that Haman was behind this plot, he ordered Haman hanged on his own gallows, and the Jews were saved. This was a staggering intervention because the king also issued a new decree overturning Haman's dispatches that gave the Jews a right to defend themselves. And so Esther saved the day, and Jews all over the world, every year till this day, celebrate the Feast of Purim, in memory of this historical event. And so, dear reader, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to find time, listeners, I want to encourage you to find time to read this book, I can assure you, you will enjoy it. What are some of the values of this book? We, we see in this book, in the life of Esther, a demonstration of Christian obedience, humility, modesty, loyalty. And these are a lot of the things we have already discussed in the course of this program. The value of mentorship the power of prayer, you know, the power of agreement, you know, parental responsibility and authority. And these are all the things we have looked at. We looked so at forgiveness, we offenses, looked at forgiveness, forgiving yourself. Yes. Uh, so those are some of the things that we have um, brought out in the past couple of programs. Uh, one of the truths we also discover in this book is how God's work is at hand. Many times we don't know how uh, many times we cannot fathom we're in situations and we don't know oh, how are we going to come out of this, but the assurance is always that God has your back mm. and God is Excellent. always at work yes. you know, even when we don't know what to do, and so we saw how God preserved uh, the Jews, we also see God's hand at work in the way the people prayed and fasted when they heard of Haman's plot, they were distressed and there was nothing else they could do but to pray. And so we saw also how God intervenes through prayer. We also see God's hand in the kind of incredible faith that Mordecai had when he told Esther, you are in the palace for such a time as this. But if you don't respond, 
God will still raise help from somewhere else. That was an incredible faith. It was. You it know, was. because they just believed totally in God's ability to rescue. rescue them. So, we see God's intervention in the amazing coincidences. The king was unable to sleep and discovers the man who saved his life had not been rewarded. And so, one of the most important things I want us to take from this story is that God uses people. One person can make a difference. And if you are listening this morning, I want you to know that you can make a difference. You can be the one who will make a difference and turn around the lives of people. You can be the one who will make a difference and change your family. God uses individuals. Only one person can make a difference. As Christians, we are called to make a difference. Very good. Before we go on to um, listen to the next track, I uh, want to really appreciate all the points that uh, Peter made there. And he said something particular that struck a chord with me before we go on. And I think we'll just pray into it. That it doesn't take God 24 hours to change a man's story. Mordecai from being a gate man became a prince with the people for the for his people and we just pray today that god will fight all your hidden battles and grant you victory in every area of life amen may god deliver you from every plans of the enemies and answer all your prayers um it's a beautiful time we are having here and um, i want you to just enjoy the next track welcome back friends to max life um we uh rounding up the story of Esther this episode and um, there was something significant in all that we've seen so far and particularly from the summary we've heard the power of relationships and um, last week we promised that we'll look at that issue of friendships looking at friendship we usually look at the question of uh, friends or acquaintances there is a difference between all that and then um, sincerely friends scripture offers much guidance when it comes to choosing friends god knows our desire to be known and to be loved he made us for companionship and we saw that between mordecai and esther the orphaned girl we saw that relationship between Haggai and esther esther chose whatever Hey guy, the king's chamberlain advised her to use, and she ended up being a winner. We saw the relationship between Zeresh and her husband Haman. There, uh, we saw Haman's friendships, and there are so many others that the scriptures have given us as a guidance. You know, um, before we go further this morning, I'll, I'll let you into some of the scriptures that are. A very good guide into the matters of friendships and relationships in the book of Proverbs which is the book of wisdom it says he who walks with the wise grows wise but a companion of fools suffers harms another scripture says iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another and of course the master himself our lord and savior jesus christ said greater love has no one than this that a man will lay down his life for his friends and you know the beauty of it is he calls us friends what kind of person do you need to be to get good friends who is a true friend a true friend knows everything about you and still loves you and vice versa and true friendship is a gift from God. And um, I'm going to invite Peter to also guide us into some of these thoughts on friendship. Because really, friendship doesn't happen according to our dream world. Friendship is formed between imperfect people among the concrete and messy realities of life. You know, one of the Bible verses uh, says that he who will have a friend must also show himself friendly. Mm -hmm. 
And many times when we talk about friendship, we always think of, oh, the kind of person I want to be a friend. But we don't often consider what kind of person do I need to be a good friend. To be a good friend. And so when you think about that, you know, listener, you know, what kind of person are you? Are you a good friend? Because if you're a good friend, then you will tend to have good friends. And uh, there are a few things, uh, you know, which I want to point out here. I actually found this in a, um, a, a book on psychology. And it says there are certain characteristics that make someone a good friend. The first is there are traits of integrity. Traits of integrity. Are you a trustworthy person? Are you honest? Are you dependable? Are you a loyal person? You know, and and these are the things. Are you able to trust others? Are you are you someone who can also be vulnerable in terms of you know uh, expressing yourself? Because sometimes we want to have friends, but we ourselves refuse to be uh, to trust them. And trust is a matter of sometimes being vulnerable to your friend telling your friend look i am I, I don't know what to do here you know and then there are traits of caring and so to care for someone else is to be non-judgmental we also have good listening skills to be supportive when somebody else is going through a hard a difficult time you know, many times we always want people around us who can help us, who can support us, who can, you know, uh, sympathize with us. But we need to learn how to do that also in order to be a good friend. And then traits of congeniality, which is having that self-confidence to be humorous, a person who is fun to be around with when uh, things don't seem to be going well, can crack a joke and <laughs> you know rip everybody up with laughter uh, and so those are some of the things that I think um, we need to look at in terms of being a good friend there's this poem on friendship by Khalil Gibran it's a man whose uh, writings I love so much friendship and a youth said speak to us of friendship your friend is your needs answered. He is your field which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving. And he is your board and your fireside. For you come to him with your hunger and you seek him for peace. When your friend speaks his mind, you fear not the nay in your own mind, nor do you withhold the a. And when he is silent, your heart ceases not to listen to his heart. For without words, in friendship, all thoughts, all desires, all expectations are born and shared with joy that is unacclaimed. When you part from your friend, you grieve not. For that which you love most in him may be clearer in his absence as the mountain to the climber is clearer from the plain. And let there be no purpose in friendship save the deepening of the spirit. For love that seeks aught but the disclosure of its own mystery is not love, but a net cast forth, and only the unprofitable is caught. And so let your best be for your friend, if he must know the ebb of your tide, let him know its flood also. For what is your friend that you seek him with hours to kill? Seek him always with hours to live. For it is his to fill your need, but not your emptiness. And in the sweetness of friendship, let there be laughter and sharing of pleasures. For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. Khalil Gibran.
Hmm. Beautiful poem. Very beautiful poem. And uh, we look at the fact that God himself wants to be friends with us. Uh, friends, this morning as you listen, how do you respond to that idea of God wanting to be friends with you? Because friendship began with God extending his hands towards humanity. He knows everything about us. That's what friendship is all about, like we saw in that poem. In the beginning, he sought out the company of the people he created, walking with them in the garden. Even after sin entered the world, God selected people to be his friends, Abraham, Moses. And these patriarchs had unique privileges of friendship, private conversations, debates with God. And Abraham was called the friend of God. David was called a man after God's heart. Fellowship with God will lead you to friendship with others. Friendship is a gift from our Father and we are right to give it and receive it with joy. However, like I mentioned earlier, there are messy aspects of things. It calls us friends, but there are times when we've had fallouts with God as our Father. But um, there we see that friendship is formed in real life sin, suffering, conflict and all. But he doesn't just reject us. But then there's the immature version as we round up from this segment. I'll just there's a mature version of friendship that relationships will be forever fun and easy. That we can sit back and wait for others to come towards us. And that all of our needs will be met through other people is an immature approach to friendship. But let's enjoy the music and we'll see you on the other side to take these thoughts further. Welcome back again to Max Life. We've had a fantastic time so far. We've listened to that poem, lovely poetry. We've listened to some of the um, wise advice and thoughts on issues of friendship. Now, a friend must be willing to address sin and conflict in an appropriate way which means it's possible we might be rejected but that's what good friends are for because um, friendship is not just about um, seeking validation eager validation or you know seeking to just please the other person because of fear of isolation no that's not what it's about we must be willing to be vulnerable which means we might be misunderstood and grace might not be extended to us. But like I said from the onset, God is the one who gives us good friendships and he has given us a guideline. If you look at the story of Esther, talking about this dimension of friendship mm. and what you've just mentioned now about you know, God being the one that has given us guidelines, I look at the fact that Esther, um, a Jewish girl, probably very different from the other girls um, is taken to a harem and I always ask myself that big question when I study the Bible the why you know he guy who was the keeper of the women he wasn't Jewish but so what made him to now take a special interest in this in this girl was that providence or was it that Esther herself was a friendly person? That must be. You know, you so, must reach out. So, you can't so sit there and wait e exactly. for everybody to come to you. E That's exactly. immature. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, these are the things about friendship that you find that the Bible says he who must be a friend, friend. must also show friend, himself sir. friendly. You know, yes. friendship is not something you force on somebody else. Yes. You know, but if you have a friendly attitude, you are more likely to have more friends. Yes. You know, if you have a positive attitude, you are more likely to have more friends. And, you know, for me, in this story, what strikes me as very important is the fact that um, all the women were beautiful. When that selection was made, they made the selection of the most beautiful women. So, in terms of physical attractiveness, they were all attractive. They were all beautiful in their various ways. However, one had a friend who had the secrets of the king. 
her guy was the king's cha- chamberlain. And so this was a man who had the authority to go into the king's chamber. He was the one who knew the king's likes and dislikes. And so he knew the kind of perfume the king perhaps loves <laughs> and, and things like that. And this was the man who became Esther's friend. And no wonder she won the competition because she knew exactly, because the Bible even stated uh, categorically that Esther did not use anything other than what Haggai apportioned and instructed her to use. And so this is the value of friendship. This is the power of friendship. And sometimes life and destiny is just a function of, of friendship. We remember Joseph in the in the prison and you know what happened just because he made friends with these senior uh, government officials and that in a way linked to his freedom. Well, the righteous man, like the scripture says, is a guide to his neighbor. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. We have seen good friendships that has helped. But then there are other types of friendships that the Bible cautions us about. And um, we have a choice to either be the righteous man who leads our friends aright or leads them astray. Just like we saw in the story of Haman. And his friends did not caution him to say, no, that is not the way of love. Forgive, let go. You are already blessed. But rather, they goaded him on. They told him what he would like to hear. Don't seek friends who will just tell you what you would like to hear. And they helped him to set up the gallows, which he ended up being hanged on. You shall not follow a crowd to do something evil nor shall you testify at a trial or in a dispute so as to side with a crowd in order to pervert justice. Right from the beginning in the book of Psalms, there was that caution about who you walk with, who you sit with, who you chat with. Because they, as long as you walk with a certain type, they will also influence you with a certain type of personality. And so we have this picture from this story, this beautiful book of Esther. We can discern the right way to go. We've seen some good friendships. The story of Haggai with, with Esther, we've seen. But we've also seen the other side of things. You know, recently I was with uh, Dr. Raymond Dennis and um, we watched uh, a clip together from the 700 Club, um, you know, on uh, on God Channel. And there's this new field of study, which is um, epigenetics. And what research, scientific research is showing now is that actually there are some p- part of our genetic code that can remain silent. In other words, we are born with our, you know, our genome. But behavior, behavior can switch on or switch off certain parts of our, 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 our genes. There are certain things that are dormant, but associating with a wrong friend Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and behaving in a certain way Mm -hmm. can switch on certain things which are almost like, um, you know, um, generational causes. Mm. And so th- this is really the, the importance of um, <laughs> evaluating your friends, evaluating whoever has an influence on your behavior or your actions or the habits that you embrace mm. have an influence on your future. And I must say, in this digital age, we have all sorts of friends online. Some are not, some are just animated things <laughs> and they are friends. I was reading an article yesterday, a report really, that suicide rates increased because uh, people were friends with um, a particular um, and the story, they read the story, but then along the storyline, there are certain acts that they must take and it teaches them how to stab themselves, how to 
com commit suicide and all that. Yeah. And there's the, actually the, an app. This, there's an app now, a, a game yes. that people play, and it encourages people. To so you see, suicide. you must watch even digitally online the type of friendships you make. Mm. Your online friends, you need to assess in the light of the things we've shared so far. How is this adding to me? How is this taking me further? Am I flourishing? Where do I leave this relationship after whatever I've had to do with this person? Do I leave refreshed or do I leave with palpitations? You need to check all that. Um, Apostle Paul, before we round up this segment, I need to let's say, Apostle Paul said, bad company corrupts good morals. And that brings us to the story of David's son, a king's son, who did which, that which was an ab abomination. He raped his sister. He corrupted what is meant to be beautiful just because his friend gave him an advice. His friend called uh, um, Jonadab gave him a wrong advice. Friends, watch the type of advice you take from friends. And so that they don't turn you to eternal fools. Because that's what happened to Amnon. He became an eternal fool. Anytime his name is mentioned, it's associated with that. Because a friend advised him to commit rape. So, before we leave this segment, I want to leave us with a 30-day challenge, if you don't mind, any one of our listeners, to go into the book of Proverbs. One a day. Read a chapter. Send us your favorite verses and you can tell us why. Or if there's any story you have around those verses of scriptures, just send them to us and we will read them out. And whichever one is most appealing to the general audience, we can, we will see what awards will come to you. But please feel free, read the book of Proverbs, one chapter a day, send us your comments and it will be an exciting time. See you on the other side. Welcome once again to Max Life. We ended the last segment with a 30-day challenge of reading the book of Proverbs in the Bible. And um, so please send your responses, your reply, your comments to Sunderland Chapel of Light via the email that's info at scli.org.uk and for all the past episodes if you really want to catch up and link up some of these stories um, please visit us on www.scli.org.uk we are also on YouTube. Visit our YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. There are lots of resources on that channel for you. And um, that's Chapel of Light International. We are also on Spotify and iTunes. Uh, it will be fantastic to hear from you. Furthermore, we would love to welcome you uh, to our midweek interactive service whereby we look at the scriptures we answer questions of any type and it's on wednesday evenings it's just one and a half hours from 7 to 8 30 p.m and you're welcome to that at chapel of light auditorium corn hill road southwick sr5 one ru july is going to be a month of dancing and celebration and lifting up the high praises of our God. And um, please feel free to join us Sunday mornings from 10.30 um, in this month of July as we welcome the tall ships into the city of Sunderland. We will also be celebrating at the Chapel of Light Auditorium, lifting up the high praises of God. Um, that's every Sunday, 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. You're welcome. There will be lots of refreshments and so on afterwards to enjoy sweet friendship as we've been talking about. Um, so we'll go on to continue with that, to conclude us to our talk on friends and friendships, relationships. And my question to us this, uh, this beautiful morning is, have you ever considered 
that God wants to be friends with you. This Sunday morning as you listen, how do you respond to that idea? Biblical friendship is the sweetest thing you will ever know. And um, I would like Peter to come in there before we round up this segment. Because through Jesus, there is nothing left between God and us that hinders our intimacy with him as friends. If ever we sought a wish dream that we're looking for is real, superb relationship, you know, friendship, it's finding this relationship with him. And we'll invite you to discover that profound intimacy with the greatest friend ever. And this is not just a wish dream, it's the reality. A friend who loves you at all times. A friend who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The friend who doesn't mind your mess. How beautiful is that? Peter, what do you think? Yes, it's amazing. I, I'm one of the strongest covenant friendships in the Bible we can see in the life of David and Jonathan. And they had this uh, friendship where Jonathan um, gave him his shield, gave him his belt, and these were all strong symbols of covenant. And it's that kind of covenant that God makes with us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you found that when David became king um, and Jonathan had died with his father Saul, David under the force and the power of covenant, he was searching. He said, look, please, is there no one left that I can show kindness to? And so friendship, covenant compelled him. Covenant was such a compelling force for him to show kindness and friendship to anybody left of that in that family. And my, my, my feeble table was found. Mm, yes. And you know, you know that story. It, it sat at the king's table. That is friendship. And that's the kind of relationship that we have when we give our life to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. We come into covenant with him. And in that covenant, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will supply all your needs according to the riches of my own glory. And so, God is at... at, at <laughs> Is, is compelled to want to do us good, good because of the power of covenant friendship. And covenant friendships, they are, they are rare, but they are real. And that is why in, in, um, when, when we are in fellowship as Christians, that's why it's so important that Christians understand the power of unity. Understand that in heaven there are no denominations, there are no factions. Um, you know, under that uh, umbrella of the cross of Jesus Christ that saved us and gave us access to God, we become one body. Yes, we become one body, and so it's important to to have Christian uh, friendships and also have a sense of covenant that when I am in fellowship if I'm in this church with this bunch of people I'm in covenant with, with them. them you know I'm in covenant I must seek their good I must do everything within my power to to promote their, their life to help them to be honest very true you know because and and to do the best I can in terms of what will Jesus do in the terms of what will Jesus do because he's our best friend says, because you will actually find that friendship is a byproduct of being more concerned with others than ourselves you know so we we must reach out to others and be more Jesus died for us while we were yes and he calls us friends and sincerely only in true friendship that can you find 
people with di from diverse backgrounds R look at david and jonathan a shepherd boy and a king's son and they still became the best of friends mm. and they genuinely love so it's only true friendship that can breed that that can break the barriers of rape. good friendship will, will end all that yes and see the young esther uh, that we have been looking at throughout this program and we've seen the power of friendship friends will bless you this morning and we say you will enjoy and encounter true friendship that will take you forward and you will be a good friend too and find joy and peace in your relationships god bless from peter god bless you have a wonderful sunday and jerry god bless you have a great great week